You're listening to The Jacob Vaux Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Vaux. Here he is. Jacob Vaux. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and I've got an interesting show for you today. Um, a couple big college basketball games to preview, a couple big signings to break down. We'll do a little this day in sports history, and I'm going to debut that other semi-recurring segment today, but I got to start with Memphis versus Wichita State. I'll start with Memphis. James Wiseman, not going to play. That's water under the bridge. Instead, I want to talk about Precious Achua. Now, while Wiseman was the guy who everyone focused in on with Memphis, and look, I think he's going to be a really good player in the NBA. Achua has stepped up and has led this team to being nationally ranked. He is by far and away their best player, now with Wiseman out. And I think another thing that speaks volumes to him is the fact that he took this Memphis team that was going through a lot with Wiseman out, he put it on his shoulders, and he didn't let the team fold. He put the team on his back, and he has led them to being the 21st ranked team in the nation. That speaks volumes to me. I really like Achua. He's a really good leader, really good basketball player, and I think he has an insanely bright future in the NBA. Elsewhere for Memphis, DJ Jeffries and Lester Quinones are going to play big roles. The thing with Memphis is they're built kind of backwards. Their bigs are their three-point shooters, and their guards are the ones that are really, really good in the interior. Like, Lester Quinones is only shooting 34% from beyond the arc. But when you compare that to guys like Achua and Jeffries, they're shooting 45.5% and 41%. They're built kind of backwards. It's a very interesting team to watch play. And Penny Hardaway did a really good job of recruiting. He got two guys from New York in Achua and Quinones. I know that Hardaway has connections there. And um, give him credit. He was able to convince them to not go to closer schools and go all the way to Memphis. That speaks volumes to Hardaway. He got a lot of people from Memphis, a couple players from Nashville, including Wiseman. Penny Hardaway is one of the best young college basketball coaches there is. And when you look over at Wichita State, they have... One of the best coaches in the nation that's been there for a while in Greg Marshall. Uh, What Marshall is able to do year in and year out with Wichita State is nothing short of incredible. He's such a fantastic coach. I, I could go a whole show going through his accomplishments, but I'm not going to. The only thing I'm going to say is he's worked his magic again this year with guys like Eric Stevenson, Jamarius Burton, and Tyson Etienne. Those guys are three of the best players in the conference. And this is going to be a great game. This is going to be a very close game. I'm picking Wichita State. I don't think they're going to lose at home. But it wouldn't surprise me at all if Memphis was able to win this game. Moving over now to Arizona, Oregon. I'll start with Arizona. 
And going into this year, everyone was focused on Nico Mannion. He was a guy who was projected as a potential top three pick. And while there aren't too many people saying that now, I think it's safe to say he's going to be a top ten pick. I like Mannion a lot. He reminds me a lot of old school Rajon Rondo. Really good passer, but can score also. But the reason that people aren't saying he's a top three pick anymore is because he's not the best player for the Wildcats. Now, that's through no fault of his own. That's just because Zeke Naji is having an incredible year. This kid came in out of nowhere. No one had heard of this kid. And he's a double-double threat every night. This is a very, very fun Arizona team. With Najee, Mannion, Josh Green, Chase Jeter, and Dylan Smith. They're a very balanced team. Sean Miller has done a great job with this school since coming over from Xavier. And he's keeping it up this year. They've started the same starting five for every game. They're going to be a very, very tough team to beat in March. Moving over to Oregon now, they remind me a lot of the Clippers. Now, I'm not saying that anyone on their roster is going to be the next Kawhi Leonard or Paul George. Peyton Pritchard is putting together a great year, so if you want to say that he's having a really, really dominant year like Kawhi Leonard or Paul George, you can, but that's not where I'm going with this. Instead, I want to talk about Will Richardson, one of the best, if not the best, sixth man in the nation. He reminds me a lot of Lou Williams. I love how Dana Altman uses him. He uses Richardson as sort of a closer, a guy who, when he steps on the floor, automatically becomes the best player on the floor, assuming everyone has their bench in, and he has the ability to take over games. He's a very good three-point shooter, shooting 54.5% from beyond the arc, 51% from the field. And when him and Peyton Pritchard are on the floor together, they're close to unstoppable. Peyton Pritchard, what he has done this year, is elevate himself into becoming a draftable prospect. I didn't think Peyton Pritchard was draftable if he came out of the draft last year. But he's had such a fantastic year, putting up almost 19 points, 4.5 rebounds, 6 assists. Dominant. He's just dominant this year. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he was drafted. This is going to be a close game. I think Oregon is going to win. But they're not going to blow Arizona out. Moving over to the signings now. There's one hockey, one baseball. And the hockey one is the Flames locking up Rasmus Anderson. Six years, 27.3 mil. Look, he's put together some really good years the past couple of years. He's got a very bright future. And the Flames certainly face uncertainty on their blue line with TJ Brody and Travis Hamanick being pending UFAs. Although I don't like Hamanick. I never liked him, even when he was with the Islanders can't play defense. He did have one really good goal, though. And Don Cherry, who I love. I listen to his podcast. I loved Coach's Corner. Um, Cherry singled this goal out. Hamannick started out behind the Islanders' net, skated all the way up with the puck, and was able to uh, score. It was Bobby Orr-esque. In fact, he put up a side-by-side of a goal that Bobby Orr scored, and it looked very similar to Hamannick. He's a very good offensive defenseman. He just can't play defense. But moving back to Anderson, I know why the Flames did it. I can't say I hate it. I don't love it, though. It's an overpay. 
He's not worth four and a half mil a year. I'd have liked it if they signed him to a bridge deal a lot more. The baseball signing is Hector Rondon latching on with the Diamondbacks. One year, three mil. It's a really, really good move for the Diamondbacks. They had bullpen issues last year. Archie Bradley isn't going to be mistaken for Mariana Rivera anytime soon. He's a good setup guy. I just don't think you want him closing. And Greg Holland failed last year for him. Rondon's a guy who's not that far removed from going 6-4 and four with a 167 ERA and 30 saves. He did that in 2015. And in 2016, he was on his way to another really good year as their closer. But then the Cubs traded for Araldus Chapman. And let me just say, from a Yankees fan, thank you for Glaber Torres. <laughs> now look, that trade worked out for both sides. The Cubs got a World Series out of it. And the Yankees got a guy who's going to be with them for the next 15 years. And is going to keep playing sensational baseball for a very, very long time. I like this deal for the Diamondbacks. He could end up closing for him. They may go back to Bradley. I'd like to see it be Rondon. While they're not going to make a playoff push or anything, I admire them for making a concerted effort to get better with this and the Bumgarner signing. All right, it's time for another edition of This Day in Sports History. On this day in 1972, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's Milwaukee Bucks beat the Lakers 120-104, to ending the longest winning streak in Major League Sports history at 33 games. Now, winning 33 games is impressive no matter which way you slice it. But just to give you some context, this was a Lakers team that many thought was past their prime. They were on their third coach in five years. Butch Van Bredekoff was a good coach for him. He took him to -to back-to-back NBA Finals, but this was a Lakers team with title aspirations, and they wanted to win the big one. So they canned him and went with Joe Mullaney. Uh, there's a reason that you've never heard of Joe Mullaney. He wasn't a very good head coach. His first year, they made the NBA Finals. You can't get mad at that. But then he lost in the Western Conference Finals. It was an embarrassing loss. They should have beaten the, uh, uh, the Bucks. They lost in five games. It was really a humiliating performance for him, and he was canned. And there were a lot of people that thought that the Lakers wouldn't win an NBA title. They thought that guys like Jerry West, Wilt Chamberlain, and Elgin Baylor were past their prime, and they just couldn't do it. And Baylor seemed to back up that view when he retired nine games into the 71-72 season. But then something interesting happened. Like, right after Baylor left, Bill Sharman got the team gelling. West had a career renaissance. So did Chamberlain. Gail Goodrich came out of nowhere to be their second best player behind West. Jim McMillan and Happy Hairston stepped up. And the Lakers went on this epic win streak. I mean, 33 straight games. Imagine that. Just to put it into a little more perspective, the NBA season is only 82 games. 
Half of that is 41. They won almost half their games consecutively. It's a record that I don't think will ever be broken. And then they faced the Bucks, their old nemesis. Kareem went off. Had a double-double. 39 points, 20 rebounds. John Block had a double-double. Oscar Robertson played well. Lucius Allen, name out of the past, Lucius Allen was their second high man coming off the bench with 18 points. The Lakers had very balanced scoring in that game. West was the high man with 20. McMillan, Hairston, and Goodrich tied for 18. And Wilt and Flynn Robinson tied for 15. But it just wasn't enough to overtake Kareem. And they lost 120 to 104. They didn't let that affect them, though. They finished the year 69 and 13, swept the Bulls in the first round, faced the Bucks in the second round, beat them in six games, and then destroyed the Knicks in five games. After losing game one, they stormed back and won four straight. That Lakers team is without question one of the best, probably the third best. Yeah. Yeah, that Lakers team is the third best team in NBA history. Here's the correct order, okay? 95 96 Bulls went 72 and 10 and won the finals. Second is the 15 16 Warriors went 73 and 9, but lost the NBA finals thanks to a Herculean effort by LeBron. And then the 71-72 Lakers. All right, here's the moment you've all been waiting for, the second semi-recurring segment. It's Mount Rushmore time. That is a coyote, for those of you wondering. That is the official state animal of South Dakota. And this day in sports history is just chalk on a chalkboard. Not nails on a chalkboard. Definitely not. Um, I got this idea from Sunday Night Football on NBC. They were doing their Mount Rushmore of certain NFL teams to commemorate the 100th season. So I decided to take it and I'll do my Mount Rushmore of specific teams. I'm going to start with my favorite teams, and then I'll go to baseball alphabetically, hockey alphabetically, football alphabetically, and basketball alphabetically. And by that logic, I'll start with the Yankees. For a long time, and I mean almost all the way through when I was growing up, There was no debate about this. It was Ruth, Gehrig, Mantle, and DiMaggio. But then Derek Jeter happened. And look, I don't need to go through all of Jeter's accomplishments. We all know what he's done. He's probably going to be the second man ever inducted to the Baseball Hall of Fame unanimously joining Mariano, which I think is correct. I didn't like Mariano getting in unanimously, but if he joins Jeter as the only guys with that distinction, fine. I have no problem with that at all. I just don't like the idea of Mariano being the only one to have that distinction. So, with that in mind, the question then becomes, where do you put Jeter? He slides out DiMaggio. All due respect to DiMaggio, but Jeter just had a better career than DiMaggio. Yes, less World Series, but more hits, holds many more Yankee records than DiMaggio. Came close to beating the hit streak. Not too many people remember that. He gave DiMaggio a run for his money about uh, 12, 13 years ago. 
And I remember there was this one game that Jeter got a day off during the hit streak. It was a close game. It was a weekend. It was a close game. And the announcers were all talking, well, is Jeter going to come in to pinch hit? And what if he makes out? That's going to break up the hit streak. I don't remember what happened after that, but I just... Just an interesting uh, anecdote there. For my money, the order is Ruth, Gehrig, Mannel, Jeter. Jeter's not better than Ruth. He's not better than Gehrig. If you want to tell me he's better than Mannel, I can understand where you're coming from. I disagree with it. But the thing that you'll point to is... The longevity. Mantle had more injury concerns than Jeter by far. And that's a fair point. That's a very fair point. But when you look at sheer dominance at the plate, Mickey Mantle was better. Mickey Mantle, you feared. Even when he could barely run, you still feared him. The clip of him hitting his 500th home run on Mother's Day, his second to last year, Against the Orioles, Stu Miller was the pitcher. Mentioned in a very good Danny Kaye song. You can see as he's running around the bases, he can barely move. He was laboring around the base paths. But you still had to fear him. You feared Mantle more than you feared Cheater. Now you feared Cheater more in a clutch spot. There's no one who you wanted up to bat more in a clutch spot than Jeter. No question about that. But for most of the game, I guarantee you pitchers would tell you that they'd take their chances with Jeter and not pitch to a guy who could hit it 500 feet out of the stadium, which he did once. I guarantee you that if Mantle had stayed healthy throughout his whole career... He'd have hit 600 home runs easy. He may have even hit 700 home runs. His power was that effortless. Tomorrow, I'm going to be previewing the NFL playoff games, along with breaking down any other sports news that breaks. Until then, I am Jacob Volk saying, shout out to you, Buck Henry.